man? Uh, it's been a heck of a week. Um, we closed on the house this week. Uh, we got the ducts clean. We got the internet connected at the new place. I lifted a load of boxes and a half. Um, discovered that the garage door opener at the new place worked yesterday. Does not work today. Yeah. So that's uh, that's life, so I guess. When are you physically doing the move? Uh, the movers are coming next Thursday. So uh, basically next week. Uh, we're we're moving up. Like there's a few things I'm moving over. Like I'm going to move all of my computers myself. I'm moving my instruments myself. Uh, we're basically moving the kitchen ourselves because it's kind of pointless to pack it up because you, you sort of pack it and move it and unpack it immediately. Yeah. So now you're still the, reasonably still packed for moving into the apartment, right? After selling the other place. Uh, yeah, kind of. I mean, there's still lots of stuff to unpack, right? Or to, to pack, sorry. Yeah, there's still some boxes that are that are packed up. We have a, like a whole storage unit full of stuff that uh, that we never bothered to unpack. So, I mean, that's, that's reasonably easy. It's literally like open the doors and tell the movers, put this on the truck, please. Nice. Ah. I've never actually worked with movers. I've always done it myself. And I mean, it's been a while since I've done a move, but always hire it. movers. Yeah. Um, I mean, it seems expensive until you realize, like, oh, my God, this is going to – it depends. Like, if I was still 20, I mean, I'd do it myself. Yeah. Right? I'd, I'd call a bunch of buddies and say, hey, I got a case of beer and all, as much pizza as you can eat. Come help me move. And, you know, yeah. we'd do it in an afternoon. But the other thing is, is that, like, I have a lot more stuff now. Right? Like, I'm just looking at the pile of boxes, and I'm like, I don't, I don't want to – like I've already lifted them once. I don't want to lift them again. <laughs> Cause of course we pack them and, and we stack them in like one room. Right. So like Cindy packs a box, I pick up the box, I put the box down. Yeah. I'm, I'm done picking up and putting down boxes. What are you drinking today? I have a uh, London dry gin with um, grapefruit juice and ginger ale, which is the same thing as the last two weeks because like basically all I have right now is gin. Well, that's kind of funny because I am drinking a Waterloo grapefruit rattler. Oh, there you go. Summery, right? Yeah, it's, it's refreshing. It's so bloody humid out. that. Yeah. I think it's supposed to finally dip down here over the weekend, but like our humid X temperatures were high 30s and very, very wet most of the week. Week off, too. It's like, uh, not that we had plans for doing much on our vacation. It was just a first time getting some R&R &R in a long time. Normally, we're spending our vacation going down to visit the daughter and granddaughter. And we just wanted a break. But we were like, yeah, we'll get out with the dog to the beach. And we'll do some <laughs> stuff, you know, do it like a, a food crawl or something up like Kingston or something. But nope, we've been inside yeah. pretty much the entire time. Yeah. Which is fine. Yeah. I mean, the staycations are great. Um, speaking of humidity, I, uh, I'm in, I, I joined the local golf club. So there's like all the, the league stuff and stuff. And it's a small town. It's a small golf course. So everybody knows everybody. And they have all of these competitions going on all of the time. Right. And you can't, you can't say, like, I'm not coming because. Mm -hmm. People are counting on you to, to show up and make the right number of people to do whatever it is they're doing. Wednesday night, we played uh, our, our league game, and it was, I don't know, the Humidex was a was 40-something. And it was like nine holes later, and I'm literally just drenched. And I'm thinking, like, why are we doing this at this time on this day? But yeah, it, it, like it's you know it's nice to be out, and if there's a little bit of a breeze, it's like oh okay, this is fine. But you get in a place where there's no breeze, and it's just ugh. yeah. And we've had very little wind here. Oh. Yeah, it's a thunderstorm coming yeah. tonight, they say, and then it should be good. But who knows? Yeah, I'm seeing humid X's in the high mid to high twenties, like for the weekend. We'll see. Yeah. It's not like that dry heat in Arizona, right? 
Yeah, no, Arizona is just a completely a dry heat, and that's it's fine. There's no problems. It's 111, but it's dry. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So you're doing the move this week. That means the next time we're recording, you'll be recording from the new place. I will be recording from my new office, yes. What kind of setup are you going to have there? Um. Well, it's a bigger room for sure. Uh I won't have a window behind me, so you won't have all of the, the weird like white balance issues that are happening here. Um, I'll have a, like a, a room where I can close the door and it's still livable, so you likely won't hear as much background noise. Um, yeah, it, I mean it's a it's a nice uh, it's a nice space. So we'll see. Yeah, I finally said fuck it, and I'm recording with the air conditioner on. Like you should. Yeah, eight feet away from me. I, I did some it. testing. Well, yeah, the noise reduction on this isn't too bad. I, I did some testing and did some additional noise compression. Uh, sorry, compression and noise reduction and managed to to not bork things up too badly. So I was like, okay. Yeah. Staying it's, on. It's hot. And I'll tell you what, like you get a little older and you get a little fatter and suddenly it's like air conditioning is no longer optional. Like it's just not... Also, the earth is on fire, or, you know, yeah. so the young, younger generation is telling me. Um, so, so it's hot. Well, you don't, you don't have, uh, you're not too far from some of the fires, actually. Yeah, just across the river. Yeah. Yeah. So, actually, yes, large portions of the earth are currently on fire. Yeah. <laughs> like, literally on fire. <laughs> yep. Uh... So, I skipped over, and I didn't mean to. But I skipped over a topic last week that you wanted to talk about. And that was, what makes a good raid leader? Yeah, and he, here's the funny thing, is that like I thought I was going to have like a ton of things to talk about on this topic. And I was, I was thinking about it, and you know what? Like, it really comes down to like what makes a good leader anywhere else. It's the same stuff. It's basically like taking care of your people and not not being a total douchebag. Um, yeah. I tried to think about what my contributions to this topic would be. So I was a raid leader for a little while. Uh, I'm going to use raid leader in quotation marks because I ran a, like a, a, a semi kind of casual guild that was doing some, some progression rating, but we weren't competing. We weren't, you know, not even like server first kind of stuff. We were more or less just like, hey, let's go do stuff and have some fun. That's still leadership. Oh, it is. But I think to answer the question, you have to define the objective because what what qualifies as good leadership skills is going to change uh, along with the objective, right? Because like if you're if you're just trying to have fun, you don't uh -huh. care about the progression. You're happy to beat your head against the wall and... Uh, as long as you're having a good time doing it, okay. Like you don't want the kind of raid leader that's going to be on pushing you. hard. Yeah, it's going to be pushing. That's going to be like dictating, you know, strategy and approach and tactics and 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 barking orders and barking orders is almost never good leadership. If you're to the point where you're barking orders, you've done something wrong, right? Like, it, it, I I have not like I've never been a raid leader, and I've I've experienced both good and bad raid leadership. And the good, the good leaders are always sort of upfront with you know here's how we're gonna approach this, right? Like you know you, you do this and you do that and you do this and you do that, and here's the eventual goal. Here's what's gonna happen. Here's what you can expect. Um, there's some understanding of, Hey, this is the first time we've seen this. We're probably going to mm -hmm. fail and that's fine. You know? Uh, so I don't know. I've watched an awful lot of, or I, I've read, listened to, you know, a, a whole lot of what makes actual good leaders. And it, it seems like the approach is the same in that like you you have to treat your people with respect even if you are in that sort of pushing thing and and uh you know bar like as you say barking orders and doing instructions and, and doing stuff on the fly like you still have to treat your people with respect you still have to 
um, you know, give them objectives as opposed to, to, you know, turn left, go right, go up, go down. It's like kill the dragon. That's the point. Right. And then, and then you have to interact with, with individual people to an extent, uh, depending on what their comfort level is with the instructions you've given them. Right. Like, mm -hmm. for example, if someone has done the fight a thousand times, you can just tell them, hey, do you know what you're doing? Yes, you know what you're doing. OK, well, here's how we approach the fight. Here's what I need you to do. Does that sound cool? Good. You're good to go. On the other hand, it's someone who's like, OK, so I bought this character on eBay yesterday and I'm not really sure what I'm doing. Probably needs a little bit more guidance. Right. So there's. Uh, yeah. And I don't know if it, you know, yeah. did you do a significant amount of like World of Warcraft rating? When you guys we were did. Playing or... We did classic, um, and yeah, we did we it's... did all of the raids in classic. Yeah, classic was a little different. When I say yeah. barking orders, I don't necessarily mean like barking orders, but there's uh, many welts especially... left side. Handle it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> and and uh, after classic, like in WoW, once you got into Burning Crusade, like there was a reactive nature. To, to some of the rating so mm -hmm. you would have to watch for certain cues and then shift your strategy based on those certain cues and, and yep. communicating that was important you know but there's a difference between like hey we're trying to optimize our chance at success here so we're going to have you know dedicated people to communicate that versus hey guys you all kind of know basically what you're looking for and and you know you're not here to to... It's completely unrelated, but there is this web comic. Uh, most people probably know it, The Oatmeal, and there's mm -hmm. an ancient comic called How a Web Design Goes Straight to Hell. And I break it out maybe once a month, like at work, mm -hmm. just as we're dealing with with different clients, right. Who have different expectations for what our relationship is going to be. And that comic uh, sort of devolves to the point where he, he just visually says like, you are basically a mouse that the client moves via email instead of with their hand. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. You know, when you get to the point where like things are being micromanaged of that nature and that's not fun. And I think that same thing applies in rating, right? Like if your objective yes. is to to server first, world first, whatever. Okay. You, you're signing up for a different experience, a more sort of militant yes. experience yeah. than if you're just trying to have some, some fun. So you're going to accept those. Yes. Well, and that's, you know, I am, I am one of 25 individual mice that this raid leader is, is controlling with words versus. Yeah. Hey, you guys all generally know what to look for. So we're not going to babysit you and hold your hand. Try to pay attention. Don't stand in the void zone. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, that's, that's one of the things too, like right, right from the get go is that you have to set the expectations of this is, this is what rating on this team is going to be like. Right. And it's, and it, like, again, it's the same thing in, in real life. Like you have to set the expectations if it's like, Hey, we're all friends and we're a family here, but you know, I'm going to whip you until there's no skin left on your back. Yeah. All right. So you've been playing done. on, on EverQuest. Uh, progression like time lock servers for seven million years now. Oh my god, yeah. What was your approach to rating as a group? Like, how seriously did you take it? Um. Well, it was it was kind of interesting. Like, we were a little bit of a mixed bag, and I was I was pretty much with the same guild the whole time. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, shout out to Ash and Oath. You guys were awesome still are awesome they're still kind of sorted together although it it segmented into different spaces um and it was there was an awful lot of people who had who'd been there done that right like uh our original leader had literally rated like classic everquest on release 
which is 20 years ago, right? Like he was, I don't know, like a 12 year old kid or something leading raids. But at that time we didn't have voice communications. You were literally typing at each other, right? Single chat window, like IRC style. Um, so like the strategies were all, some of the raids, especially the ones in classic are, are actually pretty simple. And like the most optimal strategy is, has been really well defined now. Mm-hmm. And so there'll be like, I don't know, like 15 out of 70 people who have like, I've done this a thousand times. I don't like, I know what to do. Um, but there were a bunch of us actually when we started out that had like, we'd played EverQuest before, but had never done raiding. It's like, never seen it. I've never been here before. Like, show me where to go and where to stand and what to do. Um, so usually the first little bit of it was... Uh, very much hold your hand. Okay, all of the clerics come and stand where I am, and he jump up and down, and all the clerics go stand over here. Here's where the tanks stand, and here's where the DPS stand. And when this happens, you run behind this pillar, and when this happens, you run out there. All of that stuff. And uh, we one shot most things first time through because, first of all, the power curve is different now, right? Like we're we're yeah. playing with uh, sort of modern patches in classic content, and they've done some really rough really rough balancing yeah Yeah. and it's not even rebalancing it's literally like buffing the bosses and debuffing the characters when they're in the presence of the bosses to bring it sort of in line um but it was like it was very very casual compared to some things that i've seen right Mm -hmm. everyone pretty much got along there was a uh there was almost an unspoken thing that, that happened because we had we had some people who would join up, right? And they'd be that, oh, I'm going to push and you suck and you did this wrong and you need to do that. And it's like they just didn't stick around, right? Because it, it wasn't fun for them. Like they're, they're pushing for mm-hmm. it has to be the most optimal. And that's not what we were. We weren't super optimal, but we got, you know, like we just, we finished stuff. So in all the stuff that you did moving through progression and I – now you've done a couple of resets with that guild, right? Where you've gone back to two, yeah, yeah. So with that group of people, with that philosophy, did you ever get into rating anything new where you didn't have like thirty years of? Yeah, um, there was some things that, like you know, uh, that the 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 guild and the and the guild leadership hadn't done together before. Um, mm-hmm. Before the original leadership, they actually I think moved on to uh, to classic WoW. Um, when Burning Crusade came out um, and sort of the new leadership, it was sort of like it was part of the guild and there was like officers that sort of shuffled up into into leadership positions. Um, there was a bunch of stuff that it's like somebody had raided before but never been in like leadership position to do it. Um, and there was some stuff that was like, okay, well, we think that this is how it works and like this is this is what we were able to find online. We're going to go through it once and see what went wrong and then try again. So, so we did, did have, rely on like existing sort of strategy rather than just trying to figure it out. Um, I, not so much strategy, just things like, you know, this boss is going to do this and this boss is going to have that effect. Right. Mm-hmm. So we're going to need these buffs and you're going to need to have, you know, this particular item to click on or whatever. Um, not necessarily strategies in total, but like definitely some, some scouting ahead, if you will, from, uh, existing people and people who've done it before. Uh, one of the interesting things about EverQuest is that it's so ancient that you can't really get uh, good information from watching someone else do it, right? Because you you don't know what's happening. You don't have uh, a good way to figure out like what was everybody doing at any given time, right? You can you can parse through the logs that the game keeps, but it's it's not a hundred percent. You don't get everyone mm-hmm. else's actions and stuff like that. So, yeah, so we did have to figure out some things, and those were definitely more uh, tense raids, right? Like the ones where we knew what we were doing, everybody's just kind of joking around and you know, you know, uh, making puns and stuff like that. But the ones where uh, the ones where we're trying to figure stuff out were definitely a little bit more. Okay, everybody, calm down. It's just a game. This is not real life. You know, we can fail at this for 30 years and all of us will still have, you know, a place to live and food to eat. It's not your job. And then we'll get Out it. Out of curiosity, were your raid leaders also your guild leaders? 
Uh, in the beginning, yes. Uh, yes and no. Uh, we had uh, we had sort of two people that were leading the guilds uh, at the beginning, and they would sort of swap off depending on uh, what was going on. And then uh, when the new leadership sort of took over, we had uh, our guild leader who would – he was making decisions kind of behind the scenes. And then we had an actual raid leader who was like, this is how we're going to mm-hmm. raid. Yeah. Uh, and depending, I mean, it can work, and both ways are, are valid. Yeah, I I struggled with it. Um, I ended up handing off raid leadership. Uh, just I tried to like we weren't a big guild, you know, and we we were a guild that had started on private servers, bounced around between private servers during closures, and then had done some jumping to retail. And uh, I tried to sort of curate a, a pretty casual, but mostly adult mm-hmm. kind of group, you know? So um, there was some stuff that you could tolerate at the guild level that just, you couldn't, you know, in a raid situation. Yeah. You know, um, and, I, and I ended up having to, to sort of shift away from um, welcoming like a lot of younger kids. When I say younger kids, I mean, this was 2007, 2008, you know, when we were kind of really into it. And um, I think the, the average sort of player skewed a little bit older than like, you know, modern games today. Or yeah, even, it's... you know, like modern day World of Warcraft. Um, it's so sort of funny have... when you talk about demographics, like a lot of kids don't play video games like this anymore, right? Like they play casual games on their phone and go and do other things now. So, yeah. And I get it, but um, I mean, I don't play those games anymore either for, for a reason, you know, I just, it was when it was small. The, the social aspect of it appealed to me, you know, when you had like this small, tight group of people, but you'd always have churn and, and trying to keep that, you know, keep a band together. That was like people that you liked it was difficult. Oh, yeah. And then it started feeling like a chore. Yep. And it got to the point where like, I, I left the last time to go play retail, got involved just like with a couple of guilds, not in a leadership type role, ended up, create my own guilds just to have me and my alts in so people would stop spamming invites after a while and i played it like a single player game yeah forever and and at that point why are you paying a subscription yeah so and i gave up raiding long before i gave up like mmos in general you know raiding is something i i man i don't think short of like hugging some groups now and then uh, in like Miss of Pandaria, I think mm-hmm. pretty much stopped in Cataclysm and uh, moved more to like PvP, small sort of arena stuff. And in the last few expansions, like I didn't even join the, the, the Raid Finder kind of raid. So there's a lot of content that I never saw until I was, you know, a couple of expansions ahead and kind of could solo that content. Yeah. Because that's what I was doing. Like, I, I was I was multi-boxing a lot. So, um, like, back when the WoW battle chest days uh, were a thing where you could, you know, comfortably run five, six, seven accounts. And I wasn't multi-boxing, you know, ganking a bunch of people. Like, I was, I was sitting there trying to figure out, okay, I am... am way overpowered for this raid, right? Like not only am I not, uh, am I, you know, at a new level cap, for instance, Mm -hmm. but I'm not trying to solo it. I'm maybe I'm trying to five man it, but I know that there's a lot of choreography and things that I need to do, which when multi-boxing was its own challenge. And I kind of enjoyed that. I enjoyed that a hell of a lot more than jumping into raid finder and, and just kind of rolling through. Yeah, content with scrubs just being a pain in the ass. Like people, people suck, man. Yeah. I'll tell you what. Like I, I when I first logged into EverQuest, it was a much different game than I was thinking. Like I was, I was thinking to myself, okay, well, here's a place where everybody doesn't quite know what's going on, and 
the people will be social and, and, you know, we'll help each other to get in it. It really wasn't, you know, it was the same, same old, same old people who were on the, the grind to try and make money. Right. And literally like people were making a living grinding up characters to level cap and selling them. And just like, I don't know. Right. I was thinking, okay, well, it'll be like this, this community and a sense of, and it's really not, it's a bunch of people basically punching rats and, you know, like eventually punching rats. for fun. Yeah. Question and mark? I did, like I did, I enjoyed the game. And once I got in with the, like with this guild and, and got, you know, to know some people and had some friends to play with, it was actually kind of fun, but grouping with strangers like i this is the funny thing like i played this this time i think we played for i don't know like three years or something like three or four years like we just like the same same six or seven people just just together on monday nights and like once i once i met these people and started grouping with them the number of strangers that i played with was maybe a half a dozen over the course of four years Mm-hmm. Right, I just wasn't interested. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to try and get to know somebody who's probably going to be a dick. I don't know. Maybe I'm just old. You're definitely old. This is true. <laughs> this is true. So, did <sighs> I see that Chris is back in? And uh... yeah, it's the kind of thing that you sort of you, you drift away from. Like I, I didn't. I, I quit playing EverQuest not so much because I was like disgusted with it or anything. I just it was like I thought about logging in and then I thought, well, maybe I won't log in tonight. And then I spent a couple of days not logging in and thought, I'm really kind of enjoying. Like because part of the thing is is like there's so many things that you have to do to stay current, right? Mm-hmm. So. It's all right. So Monday nights I log in and we do experience grinding. We're trying to, you know, collect things and get stuff and upgrade whatever. And then Tuesday night is raid night. And then Wednesday night I have to try and log in and get an hour or two in if I can so that I can, you know, make money and do things and arrange inventory because I've got, uh, what is there now? Like I got 40 slot bags in my main inventory, which is eight slots. So that's 240 inventory items that I'm potentially carrying plus i have my bank which has a i think 16 or 20 slots um with 12 and 16 slot bags in them which is however many that is it's a stupid number plus i have like a trade skill bank which is just for trade skill materials and it's full and it's like a couple of thousand items plus i have this thing called a dragon's horde which is basically just like a flat list of of stuff that stacks to infinity and it's full on like four different characters. It's just like, <sighs> I never liked accounting. I don't want to do it here. And then like <laughs> after a couple of days, it's like, man, I got a good night's sleep. And in the cold light of day, this, this is too much time spent I was playing say, this dude, game. You're playing, you're playing EverQuest. Like the only way it gets worse is if you're going to move to EVE online. Yeah, no, no. I love making spreadsheets. Don't get me wrong. Not that much. Funny enough, uh, and of course it was uh, was Eve. Uh, what was it last week? Week before, maybe the the news broke that there's actually official like spreadsheet integration now with the oh game. Oh my god! Uh, was it Excel or was it Google Sheets? I think it was Excel. <laughs> yeah, that's that's brutal. I mean, that's it's, just that's, it's kind of hilarious. It's. It's a meme. It's a meme in real life. <laughs> <laughs> hey, do you want to talk about some more old games? Sure. I used to be an adventurer like you. Stay a while and listen. So, last week you had the bright idea to play Hotline Miami. I'm sorry. How did that go? I loaded the game. Um, I I no longer have the ability to process that much stress. Like I literally didn't get out of my apartment. I listened to the the message. I ran around my apartment and I'm like, nope, 
I'm sorry. Like the the music, like it's it's a really well designed game. Like it, I played it for thirty seconds, and I could tell already. Like this game is going to be a lot of fun for someone who isn't me, <laughs> mm-hmm. and it's going to give me a heart attack. So I'm like, nah, I'm out. Again, the uh, the two K monitor did not help because I mean the graphics are like two forty p, I think, or something. So, like, pixels were an inch square. Made it a little difficult to focus. How about you? Did you uh, did you get, like, really far into it? Did you finish the game? Didn't even install it. I looked at it. <laughs> and then, like, I was getting ready to... Because it was on sale, I think, on GOG at the time, too. So $1.65. Yeah, I was getting ready to purchase it. And that's when your message popped up in chat saying, don't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i'm like you know what I, I was i was already like having to force myself to even consider it i i looked at some videos thinking oh yeah okay yeah but i said i'd do it and then then i didn't yeah but i did spend uh, a whole lot of time trying to find some retro ish or retro adjacent games that we could oh could try out and I grew frustrated. So I'm going to actually turn this segment into a bit of a rant this week. Uh Oh, directed at the game industry. Well, I think, you know what a little bit of it is. So you look on GOG and I'm looking for old games. Like I was looking at dungeon siege, for instance, right? You know, there's a a game that's a little less, less game, but had a, a multiplayer component. I got looking at Neverwinter Nights because we talked about it last week too. And that's, you know, I, I might have had discs for some of these games at one point in time. Maybe they're in my storage room, but I'm not going to gonna dig them out. Probably won't play on a modern operating system anyway. But maybe they would. But you look at what's available to purchase, and they're all of these enhanced editions and complete editions and definitive editions and you look at like the comments uh, for the people that are buying these and Mm -hmm. they're incomplete games they're insanely buggy multiplayer is just arbitrarily disabled for some reason and you can't digitally buy the original games blame lucas you know he, he started the whole thing I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't get the mentality. If you're going to take your original game off of storefronts and you're going to hand it over to some other third party developer to half ass a modernized port of it, like in some cases they're, you know, actually enhancing the game, but in a lot of cases they're just creating a bundle they're they're making some tweaks to get it to run on a modern version of windows and well it commits like you know or it it compiles ship it ship it <laughs> like <laughs> yeah uh, yeah like, it, it's just so frustrating and these are games that i loved like i was looking at um you know Neverwinter Nights specifically. And I'm like, oh, you know, I didn't actually play a lot of the old expansions for that game. Mm -hmm. I had played a few at the time when it was new. And then I jumped into Neverwinter Nights 2. And I really enjoyed that as well. And I remember the story wasn't like overly deep. It was one of those games where it's like, yeah, we're going to we're going to let the multiplayer carry some of the weight. But I played it originally as a single player game. I think we tried to get it going to the land party once and that kind of yeah miserably yeah but i thought hey you know what two of us wanting to play some retro games let's 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 do it let's do it let's let's go to gog it'll be a package we install it multiplayer go and it's no you have to install as many or more hacks and workarounds and third-party shady mods to get the newer definitive enhanced ultra uber edition working for multiplayer then you would have to to get the original game to run the original game just runs 
I have never had any problem because I do actually have. The, no, they're in a box. Well, I mean, yeah, uh, it, it certainly just runs back in in the day on a computer contemporary to, to its time. I've had it running. Have you tried on the comu- running Never Winter yes. Nights? Yes, Never Winter okay. Nights runs on this computer. So, I, I mean, yeah, it, they shouldn't have to do anything special to it. Yeah, I don't know why they'd turn off multiplayer. That doesn't make any sense. Well, and like half the expansions uh, or half of the expansion content isn't there. And then mm. was it Dungeon Siege? I think it was Dungeon Siege 2. There's this one issue with the the modern version where like you get to the ending and it just ends. Like it doesn't finish with a, a cinematic or like, you know, let's wrap it up the content to just like game over. Oh, <laughs> without wrapping up the story it just stops and like you look in the comments uh on gog and it's like that's all that's there you know oh never winter nights i know that was a decent game what's the 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 rating on that and it's like 1.6 stars out of five that's sad because good old games was like super awesome when it started i wonder if they just got a sort of too big and sold out well i mean they're they're cd project right like that's that's one of the things so cd project and then the studio cg project red like they were they got started porting games into like polish language and stuff right and then they started okay. doing their own games and, and then they took that sort of porting mentality to let's let's have this drm free kind of marketplace where you can get games that you know that was another thing with the the one of the games that I was looking at. The multiplayer didn't work because they're selling a DM, DRM free game, and as soon as you go to connect to multiplayer, it starts asking for the serial number. Oh, and you don't have one. But they do have a place on their website that you can go to, like generate one. Okay. That's weird, man. Why why not just, you know, if you're if you're already modifying the game, right? Why not just change how that bit of it works? Uh probably because it's buried in a mountain of spaghetti. Figure it out, man. Oh, no. They're what? selling you a game for a dollar sixty five. They don't have money to spend for somebody to go digging in there to but see how it works. But they don't like when those definitive edition games, that's part of why they do them, right? When they, they initially launch, they're almost the full fat price of a game. Oh, yeah. yeah. You're paying 40 bucks, 30 bucks for the definitive edition. Oh, it's, it's only been a when while they go since, on sale. It's been a while since you bought a game, hasn't it? Because they're like 79, 89, 99 bucks now. Oh, the new stuff. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, I've bought, I don't know, some new games like full price. I think, cyberpunk was probably the last one that i i bought sort of yeah i got it on sale yeah <laughs> it was only 59 when i bought it <laughs> yeah i bought it day one and I, and I will buy the expansion uh day one yeah i'm looking uh, forward to it. i really am looking forward to it i thought it was out is it not out yet or is it pre-order now no no there, there's yeah it's pre-order uh it drops september i don't know oh. it's gonna be a crazy couple months because it drops starfield releases and Baldur's Gate 3, all kind of within a couple of weeks of each other. Well, pick one, because I can only play one. Well, I, I'm probably going to play Starfield and, and the... Cy- I don't think the Cyberpunk expansion is going to be like a a ton of content. Like It'll be the kind of thing I'll probably burn through in a week and, and be happy oh. with it. You know? Well, I started playing Cyberpunk again. Um, I've uh, I've put all of my spare time into it in the last two weeks, and uh, I'm almost to the point now where I can go to the All Foods and get the uh, <laughs> get the the bot so that I can start the thing to get to the point where the intro is over. I can play the game. <laughs> Oh my god! I was just thinking about that actually as we were coming into this this segment because I thought because one of the things that I I sent you was like uh, you know don't bother playing Hotline Miami let's do Cyberpunk instead because it's just a new patch just dropped and I loaded it up and I was all excited and I'm like I'm gonna do in the spirit of the show I'm gonna do the ultimate nerd and all of my points are going into uh, into intelligence and tech you know and I'm I'm you know like I don't know. 
four hours into the game at this point after all of my free time for two weeks has gone into it. <laughs> after next week, I will have some more time. Uh, but like this week is even when I have time, like I spend my time basically lying flat, just whimpering. <laughs> Because it's it's so like it's so funny how how things sneak up on you. Because like I remember like when like when we first met and I was like I don't know twenty nine or whatever the hell I was. I think I was in my mid twenties. It's not important, but like yep. the idea of hey, I'm just going to stay up for a couple of hours every night and pack up my house was no big deal. You know, now at the end of the day, I'm like I put one thing in a box and I'm like, can I be done now? I'm just tired. I want to go to bed. <laughs> Bring me my slippers. I want a glass of warm milk and I just want to go to bed. Yeah. You are this old is the, man. Yeah. This is the last move. This is it. This, they're, they're carrying me out of this house feet first. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice place though. Uh, those pictures that you, you sent over, uh, I'm looking at that big deck on the back and I'm thinking you could do some D and D outside. We have a screened uh, patio. Like, there's a room back there that's like, I don't know, it's like 12 by 12 or something that's just all screened in. Uh, we don't want to do it in the summer. It's it's reasonably hot and humid here, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. But September? Great. Yeah, we have like a little propane fireplace that came with the place as well, so you can sort of keep it nice and toasty out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. I'm, uh, I'm hoping to do a, an in-person D&D uh, situation. It would be neat yeah, to do like a, a a drop in, drop out kind of game where like, hey, who's here this week? This is this is what's going to happen. All right. Well, let's get into table talk then. So you mentioned maybe getting a fairly regular game mm-hmm. going, drop in, drop out. Have you thought about doing a sort of like the land party thing where it's just like, let's have some people travel in that like we only play remote normally and yeah. like crash and just spend an entire weekend playing D&D? Uh, kind of, yeah. Like it would be really neat to do uh, not necessarily an ongoing thing, but do, even if we did uh, sort of. I don't know. The ideas that are, that are rattling around in my brain are not fully crystallized it's like i have this idea that i would like to do some in-person stuff i would like to do some something that's a little bit out there right something that's a little bit outside of the norm and i don't know how much outside of the norm it would be like i probably have these grand ideas of doing here's this super weird thing and then it's like nah it's just D D with you know people show up yeah and do a thing. no i think it'd be fun to actually play in person with people that like we've only played online like it bounced around the idea of us like pooling our money to to fly chris and i guess now his girlfriend into toronto right yeah i mean up in toronto get nice hotel rooms and turn it into like a D weekend kind of thing you know yeah. play D, you know six hours a day and then spend the rest time eating your face off kind of thing you know eat lay in the pool yeah because I've never played in person with any of you guys. We got close on the one land party day of doing a yeah. little thing, but uh, that didn't really happen. So, uh, Yeah, it, and it would be neat, too, to, to sort of have a, like, travel here and, and play for a weekend, you know, like maybe uh, once every six months, once a year, and spend a weekend. We should do it. Let's just do it. Say something in the comments if you want us to do it, and we'll put it on camera, maybe. I don't yeah. know. I, I, I'm not sure if, if Ian <laughs> wants to write in the comments on YouTube or in any of the various podcast places. Because <laughs> we know no one else is listening. That's not true. Somebody else is listening. We got comments. I assume it's actually one of your friends. Oh, um, did we really? Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shout them out on the show because they said they've listened to all seven episodes already. Oh, my God. Somebody got through all seven episodes of us at like two to two and a half hours a time. Jesus. Yeah. Seek help. <laughs> oh, wait. Uh, let me filter. I haven't responded. Uh, username is uh, dadrick1235. 
Oh yeah, Dadrick was uh, we. He was in the the shenanigans group on Monday nights in EverQuest. It's Lionel's dad. That's why he's called Dadrick. His name is Rick, and he's Lionel's dad. Yeah. Anyway. He said, I made it this far. All seven episodes are under my belt. So I subscribed to your 10th follower. I uh, keep hitting the push to talk button because I want to respond, which is funny. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, makes the grindy parts of uh, EQ pass more quickly. Oh, well, that's so, very good. Thanks for reaching out, Dad Rick. Yeah, that's fantastic. So... Being on vacation this week, I've been trying to get some stuff done. I haven't had a game uh, in two weeks. We we took two weeks off from my Tuesday night group. And of course, our group's on hiatus for the summer. But I'm gearing up for doing some one shots later in the month. And I'm finally trying to get ahead in terms of some of my prep. But I've also just been doing some like housekeepy shit. Frustrating, actually. Um this is the only time since moving off of Roll20 and jumping on Foundry where I was like, oh, if I was on Roll20, I wouldn't have to deal with this. But it's my yeah. own fault. Uh, I'm doing the upgrade from Foundry V10 to Foundry V11, which has all sorts of wonderful reasons to do it. And it's running great. But when I initially moved to Foundry, I set up, uh, rather than just hosting it on Forge or, or whatnot, like I set up my own environment for it. And I tried to get overly clever. Uh. So this is my fault. <laughs> well, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know if you were going to want to try and like we were talking about, you know, you running games from a different platform too at that point. And that's when you were looking at map tools and I was looking at this and I thought, well, it might be easier if we just want to share this license rather than have like multiple worlds sort of created up just on the one server. And I really didn't, you know, have a full idea of how all that worked with Foundry at that point. I said, well, I'll set it up in a Docker container so that in the event that there's like some phone home functionality for the licensing and stuff, or you had to do any sort of reactivation for it, if the environment changed, my thinking was I could have cloned the, the the Docker container and just, you know, load one, load the other and have a dedicated environment for anybody else that wanted to run some games. And unfortunately, the that created complications with updating. Uh, it was a Docker container designed for version 9, worked well for version 10, didn't work <laughs> for version 11. Uh-oh. So I ended up just... Rather than trying to containerize the whole bloody thing, I just spun up a new server and, and, and ran it a little bit closer to the metal. I mean, it's just a node app. Uh, migrated a bunch of stuff over, and, and I've gone through that process, uh, trying to get things up and running and ready for when I pick up my game Tuesday this week. And we're in a good spot, but it, it took me a little while. Uh, again, my fault. It really wouldn't have. If I'd have done it the way I did it now, from the beginning, I could have just hit a button, just update, reboot, good to go. Yeah. But it was a, the one and only time I've really said, "Oh, you know what? I wouldn't have had to deal with this if I was using Roll Twenty. I mean, I would or I would have had all the frustrations of, oh, Roll well, 20. they they yeah they 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 shipped a change to the lighting engine again without testing it and. Nobody mm. can play, and it's you know our session starts in five minutes. See yeah, you next or, week, guys. Or it works, but kind of only works sometimes, and only on some browsers, and only for some people, and we can't figure out why. And now I can't touch my token, and and why is my token like twelve feet big? Roll twenty is really great for. All right, we just want a blank sheet with some markers on it, so that we know where we are in relation to each other, and to share rolling dice. It's great for that, but they tried so hard to make to make it an everything burger that it's it's just it's just soy. Like it's tofu, it really is, right? Yeah. Like you can add all the flavor you want, but it's tofu, and it's always going to be tofu underneath. I have no problem with tofu, by the by the way, in in the in idea, um, mm -hmm. but I hate tofu. I hate it. Yeah. I like miso soup, which is odd, but I hate tofu. Yeah, I didn't I didn't overly feel that way about Roll20 myself, like in terms of features and stuff. My big beef was just that it was so unreliable. And I think they yeah. just 
like they scheduled deployments to, to ship updates that weren't patched very well, like an hour before our sessions were scheduled every week, Eek. you know, and at least with Foundry, like I'm in control of all of that, right? Like I'm applying the updates when I want to apply them. Yeah. I, I'm updating modules when I want to update them. And when I have time to test updates and stuff like that, I can. And if it breaks, well, I just revert back to a backup. I don't have to update. I can kind of, and at, with version 10, I've been running, I don't know, three months now uh, since version 11 stable was out, waiting for like some of the, the third party stuff that I do lean on to to get caught up and in, in, in a relatively stable position before making the leap myself. Uh, but I definitely wanted to do it because there's a lot of performance improvements that are going to make it easier for some of my guys. I think I told you I have a couple of players that are playing on either potato computers or shoddy internet connections. Yeah. And I have to pair things back a lot, which is, is fine, right? Like sometimes when, when things are acting up, like I won't even do um, sound, like even just sort of atmospheric sort of music and, and ambience type stuff. Uh, just because it's extra stuff going on for them. And I'm thinking uh, with this new version, based on some experimentation, that I should be able to have a little bit more reliable and consistent experience with them, which I'm excited about. I am excited about actually playing in some of these one-shots at the end of July. I'm, I'm... Yeah, you didn't get to play in the last ones uh, I ran. Nope. I'm going yeah. to play some kind of Barbarian. I am going to be so dumb. It'll be glorious. I'll kick yeah. down the door. Yeah, the last ones we did, uh, I don't know if I ever told you, but Tanya busted Barb back out. Oh, sweet. I liked Barb. Yep. Barb was a good character. She was great. <laughs> Again, a character that's probably, you know, uh, best used in one shot sparingly. Yeah. Um, and she got to bust her back out. And it was, it was, she was into it. It was, it was the full premium Barb experience. <laughs> <laughs> Barb was, uh, uh, man, I don't even know how to describe her. Uh, so a bugbear, um, female, very, very, if she doesn't barbarian. have like monster eyeballs on her barbarian breasts, making squishy, squishy jokes. Um, I gave her the tentacle <laughs> from the one shot that we ran with Barb, where she, yeah. she pulled the, the tentacle off the abolith. I gave her to that as a weapon going into the one shot. So she, <laughs> she started out just flailing around with this, this abolith tentacle as a weapon. And then she got to, got to really play it up. And it was such a, a funny character juxtaposed with the other ones that were in the one shot that she was in. Uh -huh. Cause I think there was another guy that was from my Tuesday group who had gotten into D and D basically just as, as that group started, he was had played before, but not much. Uh -huh. And he kind of fell into that whole, I, I've talked about him before. My first character is going to be the, the broody kind of like, you know, yep too cool for this kind of like grunty the, grony standoff which you know everybody's it is a, it's first a, character yeah, yeah it's everybody's first character and, you know it's it's a trap that everybody falls into and then you get you know three months into playing that character and you're like oh i got nothing yeah. with this guy yeah so he got into he, he ended up playing a um hexblade warlock uh in this campaign which was uh so interesting that we actually pulled that character into our game oh. as uh, I think I told you we did, we did something with, with death and resurrection where oh yeah uh, in my world, there was a soul that was kind of competing for, for getting back control of the body. And it's now turned out that that other soul, as we played this up was that other character. Oh, that's um, cool. Not, not like connected to the, the, the actual canon of what went on in that one shot, but he liked the character enough that, he's now sort of semi superimposed over, over top of his main character, which has added depth and allowed him to continue playing that character because he was invested in the storyline and everything around the character, but the character just got boring. 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, I offered him, Hey, we can, we can try and do something with the character. If you want to kill him off, we can kill him off. Like we, we can do whatever you want. And Hey, we got this soul thing that we kind of set up, you know, three months ago that we really haven't done much with. Do you want to do something with that? He's like, boom, we connect the dots and we're good to go. Yeah. I've got to figure out, um, I've got a couple ideas for the games that I'm going to run. Um, probably leaning more into the mechanically interesting and absurd and get a oh. little bit silly. I think I told you that, that what we were talking about last week or the week before, where I wanted to do sort of this skydiving kind of encounter oh, thing yeah. into the belly of the beast. I think I'm going to roll, roll with that. Just re- make sure that we're allowed to thank the bus driver before we jump. Absolutely. Um, and I'm trying to also uh, plan out. Okay. I haven't updated you on my Tuesday game in a while. Okay. I think I told you that we kind of moved them into the Feywild for a little bit of kind of like yep. weird high magic shit. And and the basic premise once they got there is there there's this convergence that's happening between the Feywild, the Shadowfell, and to a certain extent the world uh, where your game took place that had been disconnected or severed from all of that in the past was, was sort of intermittently being reconnected through this island that had sort of disappeared and, and now reappeared. Anyway, that part's not important. Uh, what is important is the mechanics of how this is all happening is, is um, elemental tethers one of the big bads is sort of created to, to, to actually pull these things together. And it was part of uh, one of my players, uh, a druid who actually was from sort of the Feywilds, um, wanted to go through sort of a similar arc to um, uh, the critical role, sort of a Shawnee. Yeah. Yep. stuff with different elemental challenges and that kind of thing, you know, rather than just doing strict elemental challenges, I kind of wanted to make it central to, to what was going on. And they've started to unravel the mystery. They've, they've had a little side adventure with some undead stuff uh, in the Feywild, and they're now going to be moving into tackling uh, the first of these elemental tethers. And I really want to play up the elemental aspect of it. So I'm trying to design a couple of, uh, we'll call them encounters. They may or may not result in combat, uh-huh. but problem solving. One of them is going to be a like a, I've already set up that there's an underwater river that's leading underneath this island. So the island where this fire tether is sort of as they've been investigating is this big, think Mordor. Okay. okay. Mordor on an island with a big volcano in the middle, surrounded by this ring of fire of volcanoes all around the outside, which makes it just almost impossible to, to get into the island. So it's Moana. Um, yeah. Oh, you know what? I actually haven't watched that. What? I probably should. I haven't. You, you should. It's good. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll check it out just for reference, if for nothing else. Anyway, so they, they, they've been trying to figure out a way to get through this ring of fire and, and through the adventuring they've done, they've learned of this waterway and in order for the, the centaurs that knew about this waterway to help them out, they had to help them out. They've done that now. And I want them to kind of get into it. And then like this waterway is going to open up essentially into an underground lake of lava with a whole bunch of like floaty kind of lava islands that are going to be kind of moving around you know, I've got some potential combat encounters that can happen there. Everything from salamanders and fire snakes through to actual fire elementals. But there's the challenge of just the environment itself, like getting across it, not not dying. Uh, some of the smaller sort of lava floaty things, like they're only going to be able to hold one person and they're going to be kind of unsteady. You know, I mean, I, I've got something to interject here and you're going to yeah. hate me. It's no, no. over, Anakin. I've got the high ground. No, that's actually kind of what I'm, I'm, I'm thinking. I've got sort of two sort of inspirations for this. One is the, the, the Mustafar, uh, Anakin, <laughs> Obi-Wan sort of sequence, yep. right? Because, like, shitty for a movie, it would be pretty fun for a D&D kind of 
I it wasn't terrible for a movie. It was just terribly no, directed. Just, yes, yes. But also uh, the the final encounter. There's going to be a guardian protecting this uh, tether, this fire tether uh, that they need to destroy. And it's visually speaking, my point of reference is going to be the uh, Ragnaros uh, raid. From, okay, from the yep. Nalan. Just you know, I mean, it's it's going to be a big fire elemental, like huge. You know, it's a more visual spectacle than than mechanically overly interesting, but it'll be a rising lava situation. They're going to be in kind of the caldera of this volcano, and as as they engage in combat, they're going to realize that I've got sort of a phased battle map that I'm going to use, where the lava starts rising, and eventually the 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 tether that they're trying to to destroy or, or get or whatever they're going to do with it is going to be in the lava. Oh. submerged just to give them I'm interesting to see how they tackle that problem and, and what sort of creative way they come up with, you know, battling yeah. the elements quite literally. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm just trying to figure all of that out, you know, uh, trying to, some of it is just creating some, some sort of what if guideposts for like, well, something for like lava damage. If you look at, at 5e's rules, uh, they don't have something explicitly for lava, but they kind of have a, a a burning table that involves some lava. And like the damage gets ludicrous pretty quickly. Like it's... I mean, it's lava. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, technically in this case, it's magma. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's not from the lava region so it's actually sparkling magma <laughs> so yeah what was it it was like two 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 extreme extremity in lava hand or foot's like 3d10 damage full limb in lava is like 6d10 wading through lava waist high is like 10d10 fully submerged in lava is 18d10 per turn yeah yeah I mean, you're supposed to pretty much when you're submerged in lava, you oh, you're you die. supposed to die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm yeah. I'm just trying to to find ways to like I don't want to kill them, yeah. but I don't want to lose that sense of risk either. So I just want to kind of find the happy medium, mechanically speaking. So like two people jump onto the same little floaty bit. Like I'm gonna have oh, it's like. Uh, have you ever played the board game uh, Forbidden Island? Yes. Where you got that kind of like two stage, the, this yep. part of the island sinking, sort of that type of thing. Where as soon as they get on it, right. maybe I'll have them do do a roll or whatever. But essentially, they're going to see that it's sinking. They're going to have an opportunity to react. Is there another floaty bit that's within range? And if there isn't, how are you going to deal with that? So to create all these little problems. I cast fly and resist elements and I just fly down to the bottom of the thing and do what I need. Yeah. Well, that's why this is interesting at this particular level range. Cause they don't have a lot of that toolkit. Yeah. Uh, just with the comp and like the, I mean, we've got a druid that can shape shift into a giant Eagle, which is why I'm making it a, not to be punishing, but to, to make it actually, you know, allow the game to happen. It's a it's a it's an underground lake with a low ceiling, and you know you're going to shape shift into this this thing, and your your feathers are going to burn off. You're not going to be able to fly for very long, so that you know the rest of the game can happen. Yeah, but not completely. Like it's not meant to be punishing. It's just meant to be. I shape shift into a, a fire bit... elemental. <laughs> yeah, well, she can't do that quite yet. That would be really really easy. Yeah. But she does have a lot of. Uh, uh, a lot of water-based stuff, for instance, that she could use, which we could, you know, depending make, on how make creative more she wanted floaty to get bits. that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that sounds like an interesting encounter. Yeah, and, you know, the last few encounters that I've done have been more, like I've had battle maps, but a lot of the sort of exciting aspects of it have been a little bit theater of the mind. Like I had this one, sort of stacked castle thing that was built into the side of the mountain and the, the, the sort of final level of it where they encountered this um, quasi lich guy was this building that was just sort of sticking out kind of an overhang. 
and as they defeated the guy, the guy was, uh, he collapsed that part of the building and they had this sort of neat little thing where, you know, okay, well, they're trying to figure out how they can catch everybody. And there was some cliffhanging going on and there was some, some clutch misty stepping and, and some clutch sort of polymorphing going on and it was all great, but it's hard to sort of, and, and it's great to, to, to do that theater of the mind, right? Cause you have a little yes. bit more flexibility. Yes. Especially when it's just a sort of little kind of epic climax thing, but I wanted to, to I wanted to have something that was sort of a little bit more dynamic just for here's a whole encounter. You know, not just this descriptive kind of climax after a bad guy's defeated or something like that. Um just a, a dynamic environment that you get to interact with a little bit more and we can sort of represent a little bit of that visually speaking uh, in the VTT. So I've got this, this lava lake and I've got all of these tiles set up for these little floaty bits that uh, in the initiative order, I'm going to start moving them around and they're going to get pulled apart and separated and start crashing together. And of course the, the, the encounter at the, the fire tether is going to involve this, this raising of the lava as they're fighting this gigantic fire elemental. So it's bumper cars and the floor is lava. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. Maybe they'll all die. Oh, who knows? It could happen. No, I've, I've got one of those groups that is... Uh, they do have a lot of bullshit that they can pull. Like, they get pretty creative. And I try to reward them for that, you know? Uh -huh. So if anything, like, I have, I have trouble creating enough challenge for them. Oh, to, That's to, an interesting problem to have. Yeah, and it's not just yeah, you know, it's not just about the actual encounter mechanics, right? Like, I mean, whatever. That's you know, numbers go up, numbers go down. Kill me. Yeah. But more the environmental stuff, right? Like, because we've got well, we've got a druid. You know, druids can do a bunch of bullshit. Circle of the yes. Moon druid. You know, we've got a. Uh, a rogue, a uh, soul knife rogue that's sort of getting into teleporting and stuff. And we've got, you know, the, the big barbarian that's now multi-dipped into that warlock, uh, which, you know, he's got a limited toolkit. And then we've got a bard. So, yeah, well, you know, who can do yeah. everything? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and, and, and through our campaign, like they've all got hybrid werewolf forms that they can use on demand now because they had a little involuntary slash voluntary dalliance with lycanthropy and has, <laughs> it has some neat perks that I've given them. So they do, they just, they have a big enough toolkit to encourage creativity. And I like to reward that, but the side effect is that sometimes that, you know, sometimes everything's too easy. Yeah. And it's just, it's just about sort of trying to find ways to, to, to create that sense of risk, even if, from a purely mechanical standpoint, there isn't that element of risk there. Some of it's yeah. just through narrative, right? Like I've been doing a lot of, of more overt kind of, you know, Luke, join me and together we can, you know, rule the empire kind of stuff where there's, there's things tied to all of their character backgrounds that I can kind of pull on to create tension and drama that way with the characters. So that, you know, everybody else at least gets to pretend that, oh, no, this character is going to turn on us. Our, our friend's going to leave the group. I mean, it's never going to happen, but I want to do something that's going to create at least that sense of physical risk. Like, oh, I'm, I'm playing bumper cars and the floor is lava. Yeah. And one slip and I, I could be dead. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's tough. It's a difficult, as you say, it's a tightrope because you have to walk between, like, they have to think that they might die, but at the same time, I don't want them to all die, right? Because mm -hmm. you, you don't want to set up something, like, because there's so many things, especially in 5e, that are, like, save or suck, right? Like, hey, I made my save and I'm fine. Oh, I failed my save and I'm dead. Mm -hmm. um, and that... That that can sort of take all of that off the rails really quickly. Yeah, but and I, and I do have to say, my group is pretty good about like we get to a point where we're like off the rails in terms of like, okay, the D and D five E rules really don't apply to this here. You know, yeah, we're we're going to use the tools that you have, 
on your character sheet to resolve this, but like there's like the lava stuff. Like I, I don't think if one of them, you know, falls into lava, I'm going to immediately apply. What was it? 10, 10, 18 D6? 18 D10 fire damage. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Right? Fuck, that's more than like maximum fall damage. Yeah. I fell from the top of Strahd's tower to the bottom <laughs> of his castle and took less damage than that. You, as I recall, you rolled pretty well, though. Like we rolled for damage on that, and there were a bunch of ones. Yeah, yeah. You rolled the damn. Well, so, so here's the thing. Because it was roll 20, and I know you used to do a lot of, of just rolling of actual dice, too, when you were running your games. That's one of those points where I would switch the roll from private GM roll to a public roll in my game so that they know I'm not fudging it. Yeah. I remember very well that the situation turned out that I, I basically... Uh, you had to with like two I, I hit died. points or something. Well, no, it wasn't two hit points, right? Because I, I died, but I was like one. Maybe I didn't die. I can't remember if it was I had one hit point or I had uh, I was one hit point in damage away from instant death. You know, the mechanic. Uh, it was, you... Yeah, it was. I want to say it was instant death because I'm pretty sure I had to do some death saves afterwards. Yes. Yes, you did. You did so, fall unconscious. Yes. Yeah. So part of me was, I don't know if you fudged that role or not. I I'm don't remember to, either. I'm choosing to believe so. that you didn't, but it was an almost too perfect situation, right? Where it was like one, one or two hit points short of instant death. And I was ready. <laughs> like, I was ready to lose my character at that point. Like I knew doing what I was doing, like chances are like, this is it for Dex. He's done. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yep. I'm, I'm I'm literally on top of Strahd's heart, stabbing him with the the the, the sun sword, <laughs> <laughs> trying to beat him to, you know, getting back to to, to resurrecting himself after we killed him in the initial encounter. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were right there, right? Like it's like we were in that little little sort of theater area overlooking the the flooded, up. and like the portal to the place where the heart was, was just like up that set of stairs. So they're still fighting Dulcimer, I think at that point. And I'm like, see you guys, I'm out. We just, <laughs> we killed, killed Strahd and he like sort of did his thing. And um, we knew we hadn't destroyed the heart yet. So we knew he was going to be back and I'm like, Oh, maybe I can beat him. We didn't beat him, but it turned into an epic, epic, perfect scene. It was a great, I mean, it was a, we did, we spent what, like three weeks on that just series of encounters with like no rests. It was, you know, we, we've got to call it a day and we'll pick it up again next week. I'm pretty sure we've spent three sessions on that. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was epic and everybody had little bits of their own stuff to throw in there. Now, <laughs> If if we haven't told you this story already, you have to understand what Telson did afterwards. <laughs> so I I do this. I, I split the party. I, I rush through the portal up into this tower, which is where the heart was based on this particular draw. And there's an encounter there. Uh, some like animated weapons or something. And I literally jumped from the top of the stairwell on top of this heart with with like blades drawn, sun sword, right? I had one turn to kill it. And I did it ex like almost exactly the damage that I needed, I think, to kill it. Was it was very turn. close, I was, yeah. I was going to be dead. And then, of course, it's like, oh, make a deck save to try. Nope, I, I, I wasn't able to jump off the heart in time, so I fall down to, to my death kind of thing and manage to survive. We work our way up to back to the top of the castle. The party finds me. We're, we're dealing with um, not Strahd, but the two of the brides, I think. That's something. I can't remember. One of them polymorphs me into a rat, throws me down the stairs, and I ended up sitting out the entire encounter with Strahd. The final <laughs> encounter. <laughs> polymorphed, rat, made my way back up. 
counter was over at that point. <laughs> yeah. I, but it I was mean, perfect, right? Like, hey, I fell, I fell to my death down a tower twice. <laughs> yeah, there was some some funny stuff that went on there, and it was it was kind of neat. And I'm I'm a little bit miffed that I didn't get to do as much of the sort of grand overarching universal idea that I had going on there. You know, where that was only one piece of a giant bigger struggle, but. It was probably a little bit too big to bite off. And I wasn't the talented enough storyteller to bring it all together in the end anyway. Also, I didn't have time to prepare stuff to, to tie yeah, it all that, together. Yeah, that was the big thing, because you were still playing EverQuest at that point. <laughs> yes. So, you know, you had half an evening, and that was the yeah. one we played in. Yeah, pretty much. A, a lot of those sessions were on the fly. Here's something to do. Yep. Yeah. And you know what? Sometimes that's the the most fun. Certainly, some of the best sessions I've had with my group have been the ones that have been mostly just improv. Like you know, I don't even, I don't even have like a framework. Like we know we're working in the direction of something, but there's no way that's going to happen this session. So fuck it, you know, centaur party turns into to a dance off kind of thing, and and it just turns into <laughs> a really really great sort of opportunity to let the characters do their things and also like I can, I can work some like lore dump into it as they try and sort of you know, wrap their heads around everything that's happened it's been great yeah I, I there's times when i miss being a dm and times when i really don't you know like i enjoy the improv parts of it i don't enjoy trying to prep and figure out like where do we go next and how does it all fit together and remembering all the stuff that's happened up till now and how that connects to the stuff that's coming in the future. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I don't want to imply that I do a lot of like advanced planning for my group. I really do like to kind of let them sort of dictate the direction things are going to go and just, you know, run really fast laying train tracks in front of them rather than, mm -hmm. you know, build this whole network of rails that they're going to be on for the entire campaign. But I do like to, at least occasionally when I know that they're going to be going after, they've already decided to go after something big. I want to try and create something a little bit memorable, mm -hmm. if nothing else. It's nice to have um, sort of set pieces that you can drop in whenever they're appropriate. You know, like there's a lot of sort of <clears throat> improv that connects everything together. Mm -hmm. um, and then like whatever your, your sort of major plot points are is, you know, like, okay, I have, I have a map for that and I have a character and here's the names of things and here's where it exists in the world. You know, that, that kind of stuff is nice to have, but yeah, you can't, you can't prepare everything ahead of time because your players will go in a completely different direction. Yep. And also you're just, you know, if you do that, then you're not, you're not telling the group story at that point. You're telling your own story. Yeah. Which can, you know what? It, sometimes that's okay, but Great it's not always. Shot. Yeah. It's just, it's not always the right way to do it. Yep. Gotta be flexible. Absolutely. Well, I think that's all I had for table talk this week. Oh, I have one other thing to bring Ooh. up. Actually uh, speaking, uh, Dadrick's post actually kind of brought this to mind is that I'm, Trying, I hope, to maybe convince the EverQuest crew to actually come and play something. I don't think it'll be Dungeons & Dragons. I think it'll be something like my uh, my simplified uh, system where you've got basically like three dice to worry about. Mm -hmm. uh, make it much more focused on, on storytelling. I have, I have some ideas about doing a, a cyberpunk style of thing. And I, I hope I can get them all interested. I think I've got maybe three, maybe four. I can, I can probably arm wrestle them into actually committing to an evening. So that should be fun. That'd be sweet. You would think being EverQuest players, like, you know, the barrier to entry would be a little lower. You would think so, but apparently this is a little too nerdy for some of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh. <laughs> oh, that's rich. <laughs> You have to record that session. I'm interested to see how it would go. Uh, a, I like seeing new players just in general. Yeah. 
coming to to play these games but i'm really interested in seeing how like cyberpunk would mm-hmm. work with a pretty simple system i mean it ought to i might i might add like a a, a couple of other sort of uh, ancillary stats you know do do like or split physical out into like you know strength and speed stamina i don't know we'll uh, we'll have to see how it goes i i can well, guarantee you it's not going to happen in the next week or two yeah well while our games are well i'm back into my games next week but while our other game is is on hiatus for the summer and your other group is uh maybe we should take a little bit of time and talk about our system stuff now yeah, we've both been tinkering Ah, uh, yeah, I haven't actually even looked at mine in quite a while, but we did talk about it a whole bunch in episode that shall not be named. I think, didn't we? No, we we talked about wanting to talk about it originally. That we were actually going to do this show is like, okay, this show is going to be talking about the development of these game systems and yeah. sort of turning the knobs and working our way towards doing play tests and stuff. It didn't turn out that way. Nope. I think we've hinted at doing them. Uh, but we actually haven't talked about them mechanically other than, you know, what we were trying to solve by building them. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe we should, maybe we should talk about it. Yeah. No. And maybe, maybe not right now. Play test. No, 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 not right now. No. All right. Yeah. Small pay, t- play test would actually be pretty cool. Yeah. We could even do a live stream for our, our one viewer, two viewers, <laughs> sorry, two viewers now. Dadrick and Huzzah. Ian. All right. Let's get into the pod bag. All right. You've got mail. Podbags, part of the show where we answer questions from the audience. Uh, in this case, all two of them. If you'd like to submit <laughs> your questions, podbag at nerdingundertheinfluence.com. Our we questions have doubled this our week, viewership. We, we have. Uh, <laughs> we're actually doing okay. Um, Questions this week, uh, surprise, surprise, come from Ian. Hello, Ian. Hi, Ian. Uh, Ian's first question, uh, wearable technology like smartwatches, rings, and glasses have been adopted, albeit slowly over the years. Do you wear any technology? And if so, what kind of device? Or do you foresee wearables becoming more popular or remaining sort of tertiary nice-to-haves in the future? Ah, I see them becoming more and more necessary as we do things. As work becomes more and more defined by the AI tools that we're going to have to use to make them work. Um, I can actually see a lot of the things in the work that I do. um, VR goggles becoming a major part of that. Um, A lot of the things like... I mean, I work in the nuclear industry, right? So a lot of places where people are going to go to do, I need to see how you know this works because we need to do a repair. A lot of the time, that's not somewhere you can just walk into, right? So it's it's better, cheaper, healthier for everybody to be able to to do that in VR. So I can I can see that becoming a major a major thing. Um, the only smart device that I wear is that I have a GPS watch that I wear when I'm golfing that keeps track of where I hit what club, which is really, really helpful for gathering like, Hey, I hit a 300 yard drive. Oh, it was actually 240 yards. Wow. That's humbling. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I I don't, uh, I don't wear any, uh, not, not because I, I really have any reason other than I just don't. Um, I think probably the number one reason is I'm always carrying this around. Yeah. And, and this is most of the smart functionality I'd ever require. So something like a watch, um, I, I don't really need it. I even take this with me like when I'm out, you know, getting some exercise and I do want to track like my routes and distance and stuff like that. Like, I do that. I've, I've got my, my wireless earbuds in and that's kind of it. Now I do potentially see um, myself adopting some things as I age. Um, I think one place this is going to take off more uh, is sort of health related stuff. 
Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, we're, we're just sort of seeing the very, very beginnings of it. And this is technically not a smart device, but one thing that Tanya has now is those, um, oh shit, what are they called? Uh, the blood sugar sort of sensor scanner the, booper things. Yeah. The glucose so, monitor. Yeah, yeah. Now, now she isn't diabetic so much as, uh, some of the medications that she has to take for other things, uh, play absolute havoc on her blood sugar. If she wasn't taking those medications, she'd probably be fine. So she does have those uh, little sort of permanently stuck in, semi-permanently stuck in uh, glucose monitors that she either can use its own reader or just uses her phone and just yep. monitors it. And if it gets out of whack, like it can trigger an alarm. Yeah. You know, without her actually having to boop it, which is great. Like that's amazing functionality and it's like magic from the perspective of even like 10 or 15 years ago. Oh, and geez, I could like see five years ago. Yeah. And I could see that sort of thing becoming much, much more pervasive. Yeah. Like, I, you know, I think about people like uh, that struggle with epilepsy, for instance, right? You know, being able to wear, again, not like a super invasive embedded into, uh, embedded into the brain kind of thing, but, you know, just have a little sticker somewhere, you know, in their hair, maybe, that is is doing enough reading. Or maybe it's something that, you know, they, they're able to, like, find something in the blood that, you know, it's able to be like, hey, you probably don't want to be driving a car right now, just in case, you know, those little sort of. Gathering hey. information is important, right? Because one of the things that's that's sort of amazing to me is that like medical technology relies on sort of self-reporting almost, mm -hmm. right? But if you don't go to the doctor and say, hey, I think I have a problem, then they're not going to probably figure out that you have a problem. But at some point, we all might be wearing a thing that keeps track of, you know, like Star Trek levels of, of biometrics. Not so much to you know, keep track of you and make sure that big brother is watching, but to just even to anonymously gather like 50,000 people are like this, you know, and here subject a has, you know, these set of parameters and these problems. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, let's look at other people with these set of parameters. Do they have the same problems? No, but you know, like everyone with this, whatever it is, has this problem, then we can suddenly go, hey, if you have this thing happening, then you're probably going to develop this problem. Mm -hmm. You know, like and, the you know, we're talking about diabetes with the, the thing that Tanya has or, or blood sugar. But, you know, think about all the things, all the illnesses that can be, if not identified, at least some early red flags just by doing blood tests. Yeah. And imagine having a 24 seven blood test. Right. Yeah. Like to me, that, that is where I think it will become accepted. I don't think things like smart glasses, uh, even the, the, the sort of consumer driven, like where, while you're out sort of augmented reality stuff's really going to take off. It's weird. There's just such a, an opposition to it and it's almost senseless like nothing nothing makes me laugh more than somebody who's like oh i'm not gonna get you know like a, a google home little smart speaker in my house because i don't want it listening and tracking me oh that one's got a camera i don't want it listening and tracking me while they're sitting with their phone pointed at their face yeah yeah that you is know, and you and you can say you you know your phone's doing that right now. Yeah, but the phones the phones are old technologies. That's okay. I'm comfortable with that. Yeah, there's there's nothing that these things are gonna you know learn about you that they don't already know through your phone. And hey, whatever. Like I, I won't I don't... have Google or well, this is not true. I actually do have a Google, which I call it, that's attached to my TV. But I'm not interested in like home hubs or the thing where, hey, play me some music or whatever, just simply because I don't need it. No, I find it interesting. I think if like when I own a house, I will probably play with some sort of like home automation type stuff, but more about like efficient heating and cooling, for instance, right? Motion detectors in rooms and, you know, adjusting temperatures and just, 
you know, thinking about it in terms of, of being efficient with money. Um, I hate voice activated anything because I find it less efficient. Yes. You know, build was, house, build house. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that was, that was more to be annoying than anything, but you know, nothing, nothing is, uh, I mean, it was cool at the time. Oh, it, it really was. But, uh, you know, I don't want to say frustrating, but nothing makes me wince more than like Tanya when she's sending text messages and Facebook messages and stuff to, to people. And she's, oh, using she's voice dictating typing? them into her phone and make a phone then, call, then deleting it. And, you know, it's like arguing with it. No, I said, you know, pineapple, pineapple, pineapple. And it's like, it's less efficient. It takes you more time to argue with your phone to get it to do what you want to do than it would be to type it in. Uh, nothing like <laughs> that, that sort of Xbox One series, let's try and have voice automation for our TVs and media sensors kind of stuff. Like just so uh. dumb. You know, augmented reality stuff. Like we're looking at Apple just sort of announced and, and sort of showed some previews of their... I don't, don't even remember what the hell they're calling it. It's not VR, it's XR because it's a combination of virtual oh. reality, augmented reality, yada, yada, yada. But like they were really pushing it as a, a substitute for a, a, a fixed display. Like they weren't really showing too much augmented, right? Uh, it was more like, hey, instead of looking at a monitor, now you can have this on your face instead. Um, no, what? I mean, we put what you, it's like, I don't need eyeball cancer. <laughs> like we know that phones give you brain cancer, or at least that there's some, you know, statistical links there. You put like major like things that are generating electricity or using electricity in front of your face. I mean, it's not good for you. We know. No. That. And you know what? Like I wear glasses. So like most of that kind of shit's out for me anyway. I know a few of them have introduced like diopter adjustments, but they don't go far enough for me. And I, they don't, I have you know, they don't do anything wearing... for like astigmatism or anything either. So they're, they're out. Oh yeah. I've actually started wearing uh, glasses again, just for, for distance stuff and playing sports. Like my eyes are still reasonably good, but mm -hmm. it's they're, they're deteriorating again. Speaking of a voice activated and detective though, can you imagine living in Scotland? I said, pineapple, you great git. <laughs> it's, it doesn't understand anything you're saying, like nothing, not a word. <laughs> yeah, it's it's. Hey, I want to live in Star Trek too, right? I want to just be able to, you know, T Earl Grey, Grey, hot, hot, yeah. But when you do it in practice, it's just it's it's all kind of silly. You know? Oh, it, it's ridiculous. Yeah, because you literally will be arguing with the replicator. You'll T Earl Grey hot. I didn't say pineapple. Why are you giving me a pineapple? I don't want another pineapple. Like, oh, you know, instead of a you know a nice big monitor with like really decent color accuracy and, and high refresh rate, now I've got something on my face pressing down against my nose that gives me nausea. Like that's yeah. an upgrade. And I don't massive like, headaches. Like, I don't even like 3D movies. Now, part of it is, again, because I wear glasses and I got to, you know, usually, but you know, even that stereotech is just, it's not as, I, yeah. I don't, it doesn't improve the experience for me. It just lessens the experience for me. And I don't, I'm not sure that that stuff will ever take off. Like something, <sighs> I, you know, I could see like, we get to the point where we're building hollow decks. Sure. Like, I'm in, right? Because you're not, you're not trying to trick my brain into recognizing non 3d spaces is, is something else like my senses are still doing what they're supposed to be doing and and you're not you're not doing things that are going to turn my senses into a knot you know yeah my, stop, my inner ears to... are being stimulated at the same time as my eyes and and we're good to go stop giving me headaches yeah uh I don't know. I don't, I don't really know what else I see sort of taking off. I, like the, the monitoring, health monitoring, data tracking that way. I think that's all fine. You know, I'm 
I could see myself perhaps moving to like a, a watch style thing if it was a little bit more robust in terms of, of functionality and I wasn't having to, you know, pay. Like if I could leave my phone at home and not yeah. have to, you know, pay Canadian telecom prices for a data plan for this thing and still get like a, a mostly full experience. Because if there's one thing I've found in, in, in like using my phone over the years is the trend towards bigger and bigger screens doesn't jive with me now. Like I've, I've had a few devices where I like, this is uncomfortable to hold. It's too big I, now. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, it, I don't need a screen that big. So I could see myself if anything downsizing and finding convenience in something like just a little watch or something at times. That would be good. Do you remember when the, the, uh, the trend was to make the phone as tiny as possible. I mean, this was back in the flip phone days before they mm -hmm. were they really, you know, smart or whatever. But I remember like the, this, and it, the switch happened overnight. It was from this thing that you, you had trouble actually pushing buttons and holding on to. And it's like, hello, 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 hello. Cause you couldn't, you couldn't get your mouth and your ear at the same time. And then almost immediately, like the next day, suddenly it was the Samsung Galaxy that you have to hold in two hands. And you, and you have exactly the opposite problem where when you're talking into the microphone, the speaker for your ear is behind your head. And then like you, you put the thing on your ear so you can hear the guy and then you're shouting so that the microphone can pick it up because it's three feet away because you have a 42 inch TV held up to your face. <laughs> do, you, do you remember when the Nokia N-Gage came out? Uh, I mean, familiar. I don't even think the term meme existed. It was the, the mm -hmm. Nokia phone. This is going back like 2004, maybe. Uh, they, they took a stab at during a, like a hybrid phone slash video game console. Oh God. Yes. I do remember that. Yeah. And, I, I remember looking at it and laughing. The early memes were just, you know, people holding like massive, like, NES up to the side of their head or something like that. Cause it's <laughs> like, you know, fundamentally speaking, like this is a phone first and it's not doing that job. Well, <laughs> now maybe something like that flies today because you know what? Like the, yeah. the amount of times I use this as a phone are none. Oh, don't call me. Don't, don't ever call me. And worse, I'll don't, text you. don't, don't, don't message me. Like don't do a, a video call over something else. <laughs> I'm not going to answer. <laughs> Like ever video call over discord picked up on your phone. Like this, this seems counterproductive. <laughs> my, my whole family, like, and I, and I get why they do it. So I'm not really, <laughs> not really trolling them too hard, but they all speak over Facebook messenger. So uh -huh. when we call the girls down in the States or, or Anya wants to get a hold of, of her mom or whatever, like it's always Facebook messenger. And like often, one of them are calling while like the other person's driving or something like that. And you know, it's Canada. So like we don't have towers everywhere. Right. Like, you know, our population is very condensed into, you know, tight areas. And then there's a whole bunch of nothing. And when you're driving through that, nothing, you still get shitty reception and they're, they're, you know, Facebook messenger calls are dropping and they're just, Oh, Oh, are you there? Nope. You're frozen up. You're frozen up. You, you, know, you look at the phone and they still got like four bars for, for cell reception. It's like, just, just, just make call. a phone call. Yeah. Uh, this is oh the my... only time we're making a phone calls acceptable. Uh, so this is like the, there was a, I saw a meme that was, and it was absolutely hilarious. And it was entirely indicative of a whole bunch of things where someone posted, you know, what would be really great is if like when you're driving, you could you could talk to your phone and it would send someone a text message and then if they were driving it would read the text message to them right and the the response underneath is somebody saying you're describing a phone call <laughs> <laughs> yeah right and it's it's so funny because it's it just it's like human nature is is like this is the way that i'm accustomed to communicating that's it would be nice if this was a little bit more convenient you know without ever thinking like what if we just do like the other thing you know, because it's outside the box. And I get it because, I mean, like for a long time I resisted texting. And now, like I've very, very – like I call my dad who is in his 70s mm -hmm. um, because like he doesn't text. Yeah, you know, like he would have – I would send him a text and be like, what the fuck is this? I don't, I don't know what to do with this. 
Uh, but everyone else in my life, I, it's text, right? Like I'm, I'm going to be 50 next year, right? And I have most of my friends are like in their mid 50s and, and early 60s, and they text too, right? Because it's really convenient. You can send somebody a message, and they will pick it up when it's convenient for them. You don't have to. Oh, the phone is ringing. I have to be on call right now. Uh, so, but, so how many uh, friends and or spouses do you have? Where they text you, and if you don't respond within five minutes, they call you. Did you get my text? Uh, no. Why haven't you answered? No, but my parents do that. Because <laughs> I do, they also uh, do the thing over Messenger, right? And I will, mm-hmm. I will literally get uh, a Messenger message followed by an email, followed by a phone call and a message left on my phone to say, did you get my, my message? It's like... <sighs> I'm at work. Like, what do you want me to do? Yeah. But that, oh my God, that happens at work all the time. I'll send somebody an email specifically because I want a written trail of our conversation. Not so much like it's not, it's not so much CYA as it is. I need to, I don't absorb information verbally very well. Mm -hmm. Right. Like people will talk to me and I will respond and it will sound like I was listening. But then five minutes later, you ask me what, like, if you ask me what the last thing we talked about was on like in this setting, I'm like, I don't remember my, in my brain just goes process garbage and it's gone. Um, So I want it written down so that I have it, but I will send somebody an email and they will immediately phone me. And I'm like, we, Why? why it's just it's not clearer it's not faster it's not more efficient it's just annoying and in how many of those instances are people wanting to further discuss it or how many of those instances are people that would get the answers that they'd want if they just finished reading your email oh like 98 percent of the time nobody reads no. no nobody reads no and i'm the king of walls of text too because like i'm pretty verbose when it comes to trying to explain stuff specifically for that reason right like i I don't want hey day-to-day communication should be quick you know i don't i don't send a wall of text for every email that i write but when it's an email like here's a whole bunch of information that i intend to deliver in as efficient a way as possible where it can be referenced in the future i'll get pretty verbose i'll have a one or two sentence sort of like hey the rest of this is a wall of text detailing this. You don't need to read it all now, but if you ever need it, here it is. Yes. Here's a point form list of stuff. Yep. Yeah. And I have, you know, a lot of our clients are, are very resistant to like sending information. Uh, but we've also got a couple of coworkers that like, you know, everything's, Hey, do you, do you want to have a huddle? Do you want to, do you want to have a call on this? And, and, I find that particularly hard myself, you know, yeah. like this, this I can't, meeting could have been an email. Yeah. And, 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 you know, for like you, like, you know, the, the most powerful tool in my day to day life is control F. Mm-hmm. What was that thing that we were talking about last week or yesterday or 17 minutes ago while yep. my mind was focused on something else? Yep. Control F. Yep. I remember we talked about something. What the fuck was it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes I'll email myself Oh yeah. just so I have it. Right. Like I'll send myself a, a, like a Slack reminder because like, I know I need to do something or I need a particular piece of information that I'm going to forget about it. You know, yep. in Slack slash remind me. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I don't, you know, I, I still like I multitask well, but I don't, I used to be able to like carry multiple conversations at the same time. Oh, and, like, God. Remember IRC? Picking up, putting down, picking up, putting down. Yeah. Yeah. Or you'd, you'd be literally typing a response to somebody while somebody, you're reading someone else's response. You send that, respond to this. You've got four conversations going in three channels at once. No problem. Now I'm like, all right, everybody else. Look, if you want me to pay attention to you, you need to make everyone else in the room shut up because <laughs> mm-hmm. I can't follow too. Yeah. And it's exacerbated by now the job that I'm doing. Like it's, it's requires much more focus when I'm, yeah, you know, really into it. So picking it up, putting it down and picking it back up again, like doesn't work. It, it's really hard. 
I'm I'm super lucky to be able to work from home because that's a lot of what I do as well because I'm I'm trying to fit like a lot of it is is design stuff where you you're you're hanging on to like five or six different sizes and fits mm -hmm. and this has to go in here but it has to go through there but it also has to fit through here and I have to keep in mind these 17 construction standards that have to go like this and it has to be this size but not that size and this material but not that material and someone will say hey man how was your weekend it's like well all that's gone. You know, working from home, I can go, hey, yep. headset on. Don't yep. bother me. Yeah, similar with code, man. Like sometimes it's, it's oh, just yeah. easier to start over after an interruption than it is to try and figure out where you left off. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I've, I've had that experience. I, I've, I've, yeah, you'd be disgusted by the code that I have written to do some automation on the design stuff that I do. But it's, it seems to be working, so I don't touch it. It compiles. <laughs> Ship it. <laughs> Ship it. I do. It, occasionally, things will happen. Like there's a, there's a there's an error that pops up about once a week for everybody, where it says, you know, something something couldn't find something, and I'm like, I don't know why that happens. Just hit OK and carry on because it doesn't actually seem to break anything. It just tells you that it can't find it. I'm not going to debug that. It happens once a week, <laughs> and it doesn't break anything. Uh, All right, Ian sent another question. I feel like we've almost answered this already. Um, what is something good that is happening in the world right now that you feel doesn't get a lot of attention, but should big things or small things? Um, I have a thing and it's definitely, it's not so much nerdy as it is just a general observation of society. It, it, there is, uh, there's a propensity that we all have and it's happened in every generation ever all the way back to the earliest recorded one I think is Pliny the Elder which is like you know before the birth of you know popular religious figure uh, and it's it, it, like there's this idea that oh you know the younger generation is, is screwing everything up and they have no respect and blah 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 um, and I, I, like it's it, it's always true Right. It was true of us. It was true of our parents. It's, you know, true of the generation coming after us. And the, and the only reason it's true is because, like, they see the world differently. Um, and that is the positive that I kind of want to point out is that the generation that is sort of coming of age now sees the world very differently. Um, and the the sort of sense that I'm getting from them is that they're interested in in equality and inclusion and uh you know being respectful of each other you know not so much of old people like they still very much disrespect old people and and i kind of get why um but the idea that like no it's it's not okay to say that those people are bad people because you know they do something different it's not okay to say that you know like women are less or that black people are less it's just not okay and they're not being quiet about it. They're being very loud about it. And I, I mean, that's a positive change in the world. And I think that's important to, to point out that, yeah, it's uncomfortable at times, but it's, it's a positive change. A little bit of a serious moment there. Yeah, way to fuck up the whole show. Ah, sorry, man. I was trying to find nope. some, some funny way to say it, but I think it's important to say it. You know, I'm actually going to piggyback on, on what you said. Um, cool. Again, this is predominantly the younger generation. We've we've hinted at this before in the show. Uh, you know, I'm going to avoid the whole creator angle. You know, we've talked about you know creators finding sort of niche audiences globally, and 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 focus more on 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 tangible things: goods, hobbies, crafts products, services, stuff like that. Um, I think you said last show, the whole idea of like buy local, but local is global. Yeah. Kind of thing now. Yeah. Um, you ever want to reinvigorate how you feel about the world rather than trolling Twitter, hell trolling YouTube, or whatever, spend an hour on Etsy. Just looking at the stuff that people are making, art, crafts, cool shit, 
find something that applies to you. You're into to, to nerdy shit. I hope you're listening to this show. You know, you're into video games. You're into tabletop games. You're into to, to weird fantasy novels. Fruity goat Fancy. porn, whatever it is. Fruity goat porn. <laughs> Spend a little time on Etsy and follow the rabbit hole down to something that applies to you. Not just to to see that there's shit out there for you and that like there's all of these people with similar interests that align with yours and they're, yes, they're, they're commoditizing it a little bit. You know, there's this whole capitalist aspect of it or whatever, but you see that there's these, these communities, thriving communities uh, capable of sustaining all of this weird niche shit. Like, yo, know, oh, here's here's a person that's making, you know, fucking keychains for this fantasy novel from the 70s that nobody's read. And then you look and you see that like 400 people have bought that keychain. Mm-hmm. I you find belong. that amazing, right? Yeah. You know, like maybe you don't want to actually get actively involved in these communities from a social aspect. There's avenues for doing that. And if, if anything, you know, uh, if you've been paying attention to the, the, the sort of post Elon Twitter kind of. Oh, God. <laughs> burning train uh. on fire, driving off a cliff aspect of what's going on. The amount of people that are sort of speaking up about like, hey, rather than just move from Twitter to the next Twitter. Why don't we use this as an opportunity to take a step back and go back to like the smaller communities? Let's find, you know, some forums or some blogs or something that like that aren't filled with the trash, that aren't filled with the echo chamber, that are sort of focused and niche on, you know, the kind of things that we're into. Get small. And at the same time, get really, really big, surprisingly big. Yeah. Um, you know, uh it, it's sort of related to the whole Etsy thing. Uh, just realizing that there, how many people are interested in the same shit that you're into, you know? And while it's one thing to find sort of niche message boards that have been around since the geo cities days or, you know, weird Reddit, you know, subreddits or whatever. Oh my it's God. Another thing some weird when, subreddits. <laughs> oh dude. Yeah. But it's another thing to actually go, into somewhere like Etsy where you can find stuff that you just can't find anywhere else and see that not only are people interested in, in, in these niche things, but they're interested enough to, to spend their money on it and support other people that are into it as well. Like even in a certain aspect, like my artwork that I sell on Etsy, uh, my most popular stuff is the stuff for sort of the niche indie games that I've played like Subnautica, for instance, you know, you just can't buy a lot of artwork for that game, fan art, anywhere else. And as a result, people have just, without me doing any work at all, sought me out and said, you know, I mean, they prove it with their dollar. They, they, they buy my artwork, but the number of messages that I get, hey, if, you, if you're ever going to put any more art out for this game, can you, can you let me know? I'll buy a bunch right away. Or, hey, what are the odds that you could, you know, do an art based on this part of the game? Or, you know, this is my favorite sort of experience. Sometimes I get, like, neat little stories that just sort of trickle in through Etsy messages related to, I want to buy cool art for this shit. And, and while nobody has it, you have something that's close. I don't know. Uh, to me, that just warms my heart. It's It's... It's the complete opposite of the world you see every day in, in social media and on the news and, and freaking tribal partisan echo chamber bullshit. Yes. And Maybe I think it's amazing. Good. And, you know, the, the, the whole sort of idea of supporting communities, no longer your local neighborhood community, but like a different type of community yeah in a lo shop local but it's global like i don't know i think that's amazing because it, it empowers you to to embrace your hobbies in ways that maybe you didn't before you know whether you're a woodworker or you just you make knickknacks like you know, cindy's a crafty person i you know she's doing like craft fair stuff but you know you see people that are just taking it to the next level and it's not about 
finding success or, or being a viable business model, but, you know, seeing that there is enough supportive community out there to buy the equivalent of the shit that you'd hawk at a craft fair or flea market or, you know, uh-huh. go to a convention to try and sell. You know, I'm in a, in a, into some nerdy hobbies that, you know, lend themselves well to, to stuff like dice, for instance, man, like the amount of people making just really creative resin dice and the people that are just embracing it from a sort of a collector standpoint and, and willing to give money to people that are making things with their hands. I don't know. I think it's amazing. It, it's nice to see people exchanging money for goods rather than money for ephemeral things that don't really exist. And going back to, to what you said about the younger generation and how they're, they're very different, you know, that's another, another thing I find with, and I will say sort of millennials and, and certainly Gen Z, like they are quite willing to spend money, even if it's money they don't have to support those people that they're interested in artists musicians or whatever they might not buy cds lots you know yeah they're not they're not you know supporting record companies like they they understand enough about how yes all the layers of bullshit involved in you know capitalism up to this point and are interested in finding ways to circumvent that to make sure that when they're supporting it with their dollar a good chunk of that dollar makes its way back to the creator they are they are very it's funny because especially like mass media doesn't credit millennials and gen z with with any and let's let's be frank like millennials now are entering their 40s right they're not young anymore like they're middle aged nearly yep. um like, but I, gen I mean, z you're and, short of being a millennial kind of thing right <laughs> like yeah like dude millennials are old now um, yeah. but like younger folks are, are they don't get they don't get very much credit for being subtle and quite, quite frankly, sometimes they're very much not, but I think that they are very subtly throwing sabots into the machinery of capitalism. And it's great to see. You know, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure. The works. I'm not sure how it all ends, but it's got to change. I assure you that, you know, if it weren't for them, it would probably be worse. Yes. Yes, that is absolutely true. Well, Ian, thanks for the questions. Uh, as always, they are uh, great. Encourage a few tangents. Uh, as I said before, anybody else? Dadrick, if you want to get your questions in, podbag at nerdingundertheinfluence.com. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, let's wrap up the show with some parting gifts. Right on. I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Anybody want to pin it? What homework do you have for our listeners and viewers this week, Nelson? Um, I, you know what? This is this is very much a last minute edition, so I apologize if it's actually terrible. But uh, just before we started the show, I something popped up in my YouTube feed called "No Rolls Barred." Um, it's a YouTube channel. I, I don't even really know the premise of the thing, but what they were doing, uh, when I, that popped up in my feed was they basically modified the rules to monopoly to make it communist and specifically Stalinist. Like, you know, like Joseph Stalin was, was the referee of the game. And I mean, I, I, the, the content doesn't really matter. Just there were two guys sitting across a, a board, uh, a game board from each other. And they were just, they were laughing it up and having a great time. And I felt like I was along for the ride. So hopefully the rest of their content is just as good. Cause I mean, I only got to watch about 10 minutes of it, but I recommend checking it out. I'll check it out. Sounds interesting. I'm two thirds commie at least. Oh, at least. Um, my recommendation for the week, this is another sort of, I'll eventually burn through these sort of recommendations, semi-popular YouTube channels that you probably don't need me to tell you about. Uh, but the kind of thing you can get down the rabbit hole on, similar to like H-Bomber Guy. 
Uh, and that is, uh, well, the, the channel is called Film Joy, but the specifically the series on it you want to watch is Movies with Mikey. Uh, Mike Newman does uh, sort of an analytical kind of video essay angle on doing uh, movie reviews and 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 it's not just the the movies but you know the making of the the movies the messages behind the movies often very positive in some cases quite negative uh this most recent video uh was just on everything that went into the creation of space jam 2 and a look at the, oh the history of word warner brothers and everything that happened after the original space jam uh entertaining if not overly positive watch but um you know, if you want to see a guy talk about movies that you've watched and help give you a new perspective about those movies, uh, and then just the quality of his delivery and production, and he's, he's generally kind of kind of funny. I mean, it's it's he's got his formula, uh, but they are very very much worth a watch. Um. You know, it doesn't doesn't put out a ton of content like it's, you know, once a month kind of stuff in many cases. But uh, like H-Bomber Guy, uh, while you may wish it would happen a little bit more, it's well worth the wait. So that's the Film Joy YouTube channel, specifically Movies with Mikey. Uh, they do other sort of series on that channel and similar to the Red Letter Media stuff. Maybe some of them will and won't stick with you. Uh, the Movies with Mikey stuff is well worth it. So I have a tangent. Um, uh, as as we're we're talking about you know Space Jam, uh, I'd like to to uh, give you a ten second review of Space Jam Two, having never seen the movie. This movie did not mean need to be made. That's it. That's my review. We didn't need it. Nobody wanted it. It was a waste of your time. I well, hope someone enjoyed it. I honestly do, but it's it's pre- like the original Space Jam was pretty crappy. I can't imagine Space Jam Two was any better. Yeah, watch the movies with Mikey episode on it if you have a chance. Um, the movie, you know, in and of itself was fine. Uh, the, his video is more about history behind everything the around it. You know the, yeah. the the bullshit and and what the movie sort of represents. You know, it was mm-hmm. a snapshot of, of, of the direction the industry has been going and uh, sort of the, the irony mm. in what it represents relative to, you know, what the creators represented. Like, just, you know, the idea that, like, Hollywood. Oh, God. All of those, well, all of those studios uh, <laughs> moved, set up shop in Hollywood. Warner Brothers, Universal Pictures to get away from sort of the oppressive capitalist controlling aspect of Thomas Edison and his bullshit, you yep. know, his, his, his utter sort of tight grip on the early film industry. And they're like, fuck that, you know, and they've very much become exactly. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. Right? I mean, everybody Everybody becomes the thing they're running away from. Like, I don't know about you, but I spent most of my life trying not to be my father. And, I mean, I'm very similar to my dad in a lot of ways because that's, that's who I am. So, and that's that's what happens. I mean, especially when anything gets that big, right? It's just going to become, you know, like we must be in control. I don't know. The movie industry kind of needs to die and be reborn, I think. We need more indies. Hey. And again, looking at that younger generation, like the, the number of people that have completely cut cords. Yeah. Don't pay for, for mainstream media. You know, whether they're watching people stream, whether they're, they're you know, dealing with YouTube or TikTok creators or whatever is their primary form of entertainment. <coughs> Yeah. Eventually, the people propping up these these big Goliaths are gonna all die off. Then there will be a reckoning. Yep. At some point, someday, soon. I hope. 
Well, was there anything else you wanted to talk about today, or do you want to go pack some boxes? Oh, I got to go pack some boxes. I got to get some sleep because we're waking up at 530 in the morning to try and do all of the work that we need to do before it gets too hot. So, Well, good luck to you. I uh, look Thank forward you. to our show from the, the new digs next week. We'll see. I'll set up a green screen and maybe do the, the show from the beach at Cabo. <laughs>